today, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Sarah Allen, who is an Associate Professor of Rhetoric and Composition and the Director of Writing Programs here at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. This event is co-sponsored by Hamilton Library, the Hawaii Muleakea School of Hawaiian Knowledge, the Matsunaga Institute, Conflict and Peace, uh, Peace Specialist, the School of Communication and Information, and the Departments of American Studies, English, Ethnic Studies, and Sociology. Uh, Sarah Allen is currently working on a project that reroutes rhetoric in the pre-Socratic conception of Logos, with special emphasis on that of Heraclitus, in order to rewild the field. She is also the author of Chirotic Inspiration, Imagining the Future in the Sixth Extinction, from University of Pittsburgh Press in 2021, and Beyond Argument, Essaying as a Practice of Exchange, WAC Clearinghouse and Parlor Press in 2015. Sarah has also been an incredibly contributing and generous colleague in this department. Um, she's been integral to the whole field of composition and rhetoric, and anybody working in that field no longer uh, cannot just focus in on their own narrow research interests or the couple of courses they're teaching. They have to become a citizen of the department, they have to become a citizen of the university, and they have to become a citizen of the community which means basically mandatory public intellectual. Uh, Sarah has been remarkably good at that and also shows a real talent for being able to deal with any audience at the place where they are working with her. So she's remarkably good with freshmen, she's remarkably good with her colleagues, she's remarkably good with people in national and international organizations thinking about these fields. She's generous and she's highly collegial, which sometimes not always be the case, and it gives me great pleasure to show that great minds think alike because both the English department and the Center for Biographical Research wanted her to give a talk this semester, and I'm very glad she's about to. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Sarah Allen. <laughs> so much, Craig, for that. Um, and I wanted to say thank you for the Center of, Bi of Biographical Research for sponsoring and for inviting me to do this talk in the English department, for inviting me to do this talk also. And I wanted to say thank you to the many sponsors. Um, and, and of course, thank you so much um, to all of you for being here. It's so lovely to see um, familiar, friendly faces. Um, this is a work in progress, <laughs> um, and uh, so it's a bit messy, I apologize. I'm trying to, in this presentation, sort of um, condense two chapters, one of which is a gnarly train wreck, and the other one is like kind of okay. So yeah, I apologize <laughs> right up front. but. Um, and the spider web was not actually supposed to be about Halloween, <laughs> but extra bonus, it's actually about um, the web of life. Anyway, so without further ado. Okay. Um, Edward Chiappa's Be The Beginnings of Rhetorical Theory in Classical Greece challenges the generally accepted origins of rhetoric in ancient Greece, which is that it began with a sophist. As any good student of rhetoric knows, the sophists are a mixed bag morally at best. Plato famously accuses them in Gordius of being fundamentally immoral because they were manipulative, greedy, and most importantly, totally uninterested in the truth, what Plato calls forms or ideas. But historians have shown that they emerged at a particular historical moment out of necessity. As Schiappa notes, quote, Okay, I'm going to try to remember slides. I'm sort of notorious for not remembering slides. Okay, so um, according to Schiappa, the basic facts of the standard account of the invention of the art of rhetoric are as follows. The overthrow of tyranny in Sicily around 467 BCE, so this is the 5th century, right? Standard narrative and the resulting establishment of a democracy created a sudden demand for the teaching of rhetoric for citizens' use in the law courts and assembly. Two Sicilians, Corax, and this, his name will matter in a moment, 
the ancient Greek word for crow, and his student Tisius responded to this demand by inventing rhetorical theory through the introduction of the first art of rhetoric, which is like the first handbook of rhetoric. Schiappa will challenge many of these assumptions through careful analysis of historical texts, revealing that not only is the category of sophist fundamentally flawed because the ideas articulated by the speakers swept into that category have little, if anything, in common, but also that the term rhetoric did not exist until the fourth century. Um, in fact, it seems likely that it was Plato, a figure who continues thousands of years later to plague the field with accusations of immorality, evidenced by its disregard for the, his particular conception of truth. It's him who coined the term. Whether the field originated in Plato's rebuke of rhetoric and its practitioners at the same moment that he named it, or in the tales of the blustering Corax and Tisius, the field is ruined, ruined, rooted in, ac in accusations of moral turpitude. George Kennedy, for example, relates that Tisius refused to pay for his instruction when brought to court for this violation. He argued that if he won, then of course he wouldn't have to pay. But if he lost, then he shouldn't have to pay either because it would mean that his training by Corax and rhetoric was ineffective. <laughs> Kennedy closes the story by stating that, quote, the courts turned them out both with the ep epigram, a bad egg from a bad crow. <laughs> bad clearly being a moral designation. If we're defining rhetoric according to its relation to morality and truth, as has been the case in most histories of the field, then the, rhetoric's then the field's roots make the study of persuasion a nasty business. Jump forward 24 or 2500 years, and the work is no less so, due to the fact that the stakes are even higher. Alternative facts run rampant, and will likely become even more pervasive and undetectable with AI technologies, as many of its own inventors have argued. Argue. Perhaps the true relativist, the most exaggerated version of the modern day sophist, would say that all truths are small truths anyway, that they are all contextual, even subjective, and that everyone should be entitled to their truths because variety is beautiful and diversity is inherently good. However, we face global warming, climate change. Scientists are pointing to the sixth extinction, another mass extinction event that will rival the loss of the dinosaurs. What is actually happening to our planet matters. It matters how we negotiate across moralities and truths, because that negotiation will shape the ways that we move forward together with the many species that continue to persist for the moment on this planet. What I'm going to suggest here will seem strange then, because I'm suggesting that the field of rhetoric gives up its rooting in the millennia-long debates about morality and truth. Instead, I will make the case that rhetoric, while it might necessarily be entangled in such debates, as well as debates about the identity and power and so on, is fundamentally about relations, about how relations are constituted, about their character, their substance, their dynamism, their effects, as well as how relations come to be, change, and die. I do not think I'm overstating the case when I say that rhetoric must become more than it is. It must become a more than human rhetoric. And I would suggest that one way to do so would be to reinvent itself. Not in the straining, splintering ways that we've all been working to make it do, adding this, subtracting that. I think it's time to repot it, as my mother would say, to reroot it. This presentation is part of a larger project that attempts such a rerouting from the accusations of Plato and the stories of rhetorical swagger and figures like Tisius and, so and the sophist Gorgias to an older idea, an idea about how relations are structured at all levels of existence. And this is gonna get crazy now. <laughs> Namely, the pre-Socratic conceptions of logos. In some ways, I'm not really offering anything new by exploring the ancient entanglements of rhetoric and logos. Books have been written about those entanglements, including a couple that I've referenced here. However, with the exception of Schiappa's work, who draws a thick line between rhetoric and logos, those efforts tend to take as a given a close, even synonymous connection between the two. In fact, in the field's go-to translation of Gordius's encomium of Helen, one of the canonical works of the field, this is in the Greek, obviously, Kennedy translates 
the word logos, which I've circled there, um, into the word speech. And in his commentary, he does not note any issue in doing so. However, Gorgias never uses the word rhetoric, partly because the word didn't exist yet, but also because according to Schiappa, neither did the discipline. <laughs> So, while the work I am attempting here is not altogether new, it does ask that we consider a different way of thinking about the relation between logos and rhetoric. I'm not asking us to see rhetoric as a kind of conceptual offspring of logos. Rather, I want to treat the two as distinct concepts. But in doing so, I want to show logos, how logos structures rhetoric as it does everything else. Consequently, I'm suggesting that by rerouting rhetoric in the pre-Socratic notions of logos, we rewild rhetoric. So, rewilding is a contentious contemporary practice. Basically, rewilding is a concept and movement inside conservation efforts, so its relationship to conservation is complicated. That focuses on ways of regenerating natural ecosystems by reintroducing native species, reducing human intervention, and allowing nature to take a more self-regulating course. Problems with the approach might be immediately obvious. With a quick look at the language used in the prior sentence, what counts as natural? Um, does regeneration mean restoring an ecosystem to some prior existing state? And so how far back do we go? Are we talking the Neolithic? And that's very often where we go. Um, in some ways, this project will grapple with similar questions. What makes logos a generative, and to use conservation terminology, perhaps sustainable concept for rhetoric? Which conception of logos should we return to? And what would rooting the field in that concept do to this traditionally humanistic field with its priority centered in human identities, relationship structures, and lives? At its core, the goals of rewilding are to promote biodiversity, improve ecosystem health, and create more resilient and self-sustaining landscapes. Those efforts are generally understood as requiring humans to reduce their presence in said landscapes. However, a more precise explanation would be to say that those efforts require humans to be present in very particular ways, at the expense of other ways. For example, the hotly debated three C's of um, rewilding are cores, carnivores, corridors, and carnivores. Cores are areas that are identified as needing ecological restoration and are regenerated. Corridors allow for the movement of animals across these, um, these cores and to create connections between them. And carnivores are reintroduced in said cores to make regeneration possible. In each effort, humans are involved, identifying and protecting cores, creating corridors, and introducing carnivores. Though what counts as appropriate ongoing human involvement is a point of contention. For example, should humans get involved when wild animals living in these spaces are hurt or die? We rhetoricians are faced with similar questions about the roles and responsibilities of humans in our rhetorical engagement with the non-human animals and objects that share our worlds. I don't believe that these questions should be driven by the goal of fixing the problems that humans have created with regard to anthropogenic climate change. That ship, so far as I can tell, has sailed. Rather, my hope is that we, broadly conceived, including the many creatures and objects with which we share this planet, can invent a future that might be different from the one looming before us, in which up to a million species will be driven to extinction in the coming decades by human activity. As explained in the IPCC's Climate Change 2023 Synthesis Report Summary for Policymakers, climate change is a threat to human well-being and planetary health. There is a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. Climate resilient development integrates adaptation and mitigation to advance sustainable development for all and is enabled by increased international cooperation, including improved access to adequate financial resources, particularly for vulnerable regions, sectors, and groups, and inclusive governance and in coordinated policies. The choices and actions implemented in this decade will have impacts now for thousands of years. 
We educators and rhetoricians have a responsibility to support such efforts by remaking our relationships with non-human creatures and objects, as well as by inviting our students to do the same. But simply, again, we need to find ways forward together. I think I'm stating the obvious when I say that this is no easy task. If I'm being honest here when I say, I am being honest here when I say that in taking a quick glance at the headlines today, or any day since I learned to read for that matter, I'm not at all confident that humans have the capacity or the will to work together across lines of difference and different investments toward a future that might at least prop up a few species for survival. In my youth, I often wondered what it was about humans that made us so destructive, or to be more precise, so careless with our industry and creativity. I've given up on finding any enduring answer to that question. I'm more interested in now in reinventing ourselves. And to my mind, part of my responsibility then is to support the field's efforts to reinvent human beings as rhetorical beings. But there's the rub. What is a rhetorical being? According to Plato's Gorgias, the rhetorical being is a manipulative, greedy corrupter who is hell-bent on coming out right in any encounter. That might be a bit strong, but certainly in his earlier works, Plato didn't trust rhetorical beings and thought them to be responsible for many of the world's ills. That is, until he was able to remake rhetoric toward his own purposes to serve truth. In a way, I suppose I'm attempting something similar. I'm proposing that we remake rhetoric and thereby what constitutes a rhetorical being, but not toward a different notion of truth, rather toward a different depth. That is an idea that I feel like I'm <laughs> confronted by daily, because I am a reader of Nietzsche, and thanks to this project, a reader of Heraclitus. Both are concerned with death, so much so that I think someone could probably make the argument that their projects are about exactly that concept not Logos or the Dionysian or any of the other claims I have made in my own work. That said, Logos and the Dionysian offer us something interesting in the way of thinking about rhetorical beings as beings who seek, move, and engage in depths. To be clear, I'm not saying that rhetoricians are inherently de deeper thinkers than others. Nothing so benign or arrogant. Rather, I'm suggesting that creatures and objects that exist in rhetorical relations, that is, relations that necessarily involve negotiation, are always working at ever sliding, slipping, scaling depths. To explain this concept of depth, I have to start with the concept of logos, which is a slippery concept, in no small part because its meanings are both multiple and mutating across history. Any good rhetoric student today will tell you that logos is the appeal to reason, thanks to Aristotle's notorious efforts to compress the concept after his teacher Plato. While Aristotle was not interested in absolute truths, he was interested in rational discourse, so logos was an important player in any effort to convey reason-based, rationally produced knowledge. But logos has a much longer history. I cannot trace all that history here that is not the project, so instead I turn to the version of Logos that was explained, and I use that word very loosely, by Heraclitus. The focus on Heraclitus is admittedly informed by my ongoing obsession with Nietzsche's work, and his work is notoriously entangled with Heraclitus's. But it's also due to the fact that it is Heraclitus's version of Logos that was taken seriously by Plato. Um, whose importance in the history of the field of rhetoric, again, can't be overstated. But his influence extends well beyond Plato. His influence is so profuse that Charles Kahn, the famous translator and reader of Heraclitus, does not bother to justify his own book-length study on Heraclitus's work. Would love to be able to know. Um, he states, quote, I will not defend my view of Heraclitus's importance in taking him seriously as a thinker, I simply follow the ancient tradition from Plato to Plotinus, not to mention the modern tradition from Hegel to Nietzsche and Heidegger." As anyone who has read a single aphorism from Heraclitus knows, though, his work is difficult at best. There are good reasons why he has been described as the obscure. Let me give you an example. Um, the first sentence of the first of the fragments of Heraclitus are given to us by Khan, and they begin with this, which I won't even try to pronounce, but 
John, you probably could. But it translates basically this logos here. Um, so Khan, the translator, he's, he explains and basically what that first part means is this discourse which I am presenting, which you're about to read. However, Khan goes on to explain that the next two words, again, I won't pronounce, but they basically mean being forever, confronts us with a dilemma that has plagued readers since Aristotle and has been the subject of endless dispute among modern commentators. And that is what the word, always forever, can be, that it can be construed either with the words that precede, which is this, logos, or the words that follow, which is that men fail to comprehend. So is it logos that's forever, or men not comprehending logos that is forever? Right. Um, so for my part, and I think for most readers, Heraclitus, the confusion is intentional. Heraclitus means both to be true. Logos is forever, and men will always fail to understand it. However, where I part ways with other readers is this. I think, and I'm suggesting here, that the failure to understand is due to the structure of all relations in the cosmos. Bear with me. <laughs> Khan offers the most concise, to my mind, definition of logos in Heraclitus' thought. It is the internal, eternal structure of the world as it manifests in discourse. And the key here is in discourse, right? Manifest in discourse. Um, that's what makes it distinct from the concept of cosmos. Cosmos, as Heraclitus and other pre-Socratics understood it, was not the world out there, which is how we tend to think of it, but the order, the harmony of the world. And I should note too that world should be conceived as broadly as possible here for the ancients who are interested in the order of all things, all existence. They wouldn't have distinguished between Earth and the universe. What distinguishes Logos from Cosmos then is that, it, that the Logos is about the ways in which that order manifests in discourse in particular. Order, however, and manifestation do not impart clarity. No matter what 2,000 years of Western philosophy has otherwise suggested, rather in the face of the manifestation of the universe's order or harmony, we humans are, according to Heraclitus, quote, deaf and dumb. The reason for our stupidity? Here's what Heraclitus says. These are just a couple. <laughs> Most men do not think things in the way they encounter them, nor do they recognize that they, what they experience, but believe their own opinions. <laughs> and men forget where the, the way leads, and they are at odds with that which they most constantly associate. And what they meet with every day seems strange to them. We should not act and speak like men asleep. In a surface reading, we could draw from these fragments a number of ideas. For example, that our, opinion, our opinions lie like a blinding fog over our experiences of the world, and that we are at odds with and do not really understand the things that are most familiar to us. These are the same problems that are explored at great lengths in Nietzsche's work. And I would suggest, especially given Nietzsche's dedication to Heraclitus's work, that we can turn to him to get beyond these surface problems, these surface readings of Heraclitus. In the process, I seek to explore a particular and a very tentative reading of the structure of the cosmos that might be responsible, in part, for the human's fundamental failure to understand the logos, both in everything that the human encounters, as well as in all that the human experiences. But simply, I would suggest that the structure of the cosmos is aesthetic, but not in the sense that most of us in English studies might understand the concept. Rather, the concept of the aesthetic I draw from a particular moment in a particular work by Nietzsche is truth and lies in a non-moral sense. In the process of explaining this particular instantiation of the concept of the aesthetic, I'm going to offer a strange reading of truth and lies one that departs in dramatic ways from the accepted readings in my field. As Heraclitus famously states, I went in search of myself. And according to Kahn, working from another famous translator of Heraclitus, Herman Diles, quote, once Heraclitus had encountered the law of the microcosm within himself, he discovered it for a second time in the external world, end quote. I quote at length Kahn to explain, he states, 
I believe that Dahls was right in locating the central insight of Heraclitus in this identity of structure between the inner personal world of the psyche and the larger natural world of the universe. Heraclitus' doctrines of fire, cosmic order, elemental transformation serve as more than illustrations, but they are significant only insofar as they reveal a general truth about the unity of opposites. A truth whose primary application for human beings lies in a deeper understanding of their own experience of life and death, sleeping and waking, youth and old age, and we can go on and on around these opposites, right? To unpack this quote a bit, if you've encountered Heraclitus in your studies, then you know that he focuses in his commentary on the Logos on its structure being that of both opposites and unity. This has made his commentary confusing and contentious for scholars across many centuries as he tries in aphorism after aphorism to capture both in a single statement. Thus, in the opening line, in his fragments as noted above, he's establishing an opposition between logos and humans, that the latter cannot understand the former, while also establishing a unity in the eternally frustrated relation between the human and the logos. Nietzsche, who seems to understand Heraclitus better than most, or more precisely, plays inside the structures and ideas articulated by Heraclitus more than most, investigates in truth and lies what this structure of unity and opposition might mean for human knowledge, morality, creativity, but also what it yet might mean for the aesthetic relation that makes human knowledge, morality, and creativity possible. In the opening lines of Truth and Lies, Nietzsche says, for human intellect has no additional mission which would lead it beyond human life, rather it is human, and only its possessor and begetter takes it so solemnly, as if the world's axis turn within itself. But if we could communicate with the gnat, we would learn that he likewise flies through the air with the same solemnity, that he feels the flying center of the universe within himself. I think it's fair to say that most of us in rhetoric have taken the point of these lines to be that there are limitations to human intellect because of the limitations of human perception and because of the arrogance that is accrued, ironically, by the human about his intellect what it is supposed to be able to do, namely outsmart human perception by transcending it. But if we read these lines according to Nietzsche's persistent engagement with Heraclitus, then we see a different meaning, that not only does the human feel the flying center of the universe within himself, but so does the gnat, because he does not bother to explain, the structure of the universe is the structure of all things in the universe. So this isn't so much a critique, which is how these lines are generally read, but just a description of the conditions of the universe. That is, all of existence takes its own experience to be true, and all of existence is kept from knowing anything but its own ex experience. This limitation, the gap between experience and existence, is the structure of the cosmos, <laughs> and therefore, the structure of the logos too. So, for example, as human beings, in becoming a person, an individual, we recognize our differences from, our opposition to others, and I mean others broadly, a process Nietzsche calls dissimulation. We also necessarily participate in unity in what he calls assimilation, inheriting the knowledges, moralities, and languages produced across histories and cultures. Language, too, functions according to the same structure of opposition and unity. It works by unifying the infinite variety of things inside categories, the category of true, for so many individual various things. It also works inside the structure of opposites, between the word and the thing, which are necessarily utterly different from each other. Tree designates not the thing growing outside of our window, but a human concept. That opposition is implacable. The gap between thing and word is untraceable. And I'd suggest following Nietzsche that it structures every language, every mode of perception and communication, all of discourse across the wide variations, the species, and the individuals that participate in it. As such, all creatures, including everything, um, are limited by their perception. None has access to an objective measure of the world, Nietzsche explains. It's, diffi it's a difficult thing for the human to admit to himself 
that the insect or the bird perceives an entirely different world from the one that man does, and that the question of which of these perceptions of the world is more correct, the more correct one, is quite meaningless. For the world would have to have been decided previously in accordance with the criterion of the correct perception, which means in accordance with a criterion that doesn't exist, right? That it isn't available. We're good. But here's where we're not good. <laughs> but in any case, it seems to me that the correct perception, which would mean, quote, the adequate expression of an object in the subject, is a contradictory possibility. For between two absolutely different spheres, as between subject and object, there is no causality, no correctness, and no expression. There is at most an aesthetic relation. He's just totally blown himself up. So, beyond the standard reading of this passage, which we tend to focus here and ignore here, um, that Nietzsche's point is about the limitedness of all perception. If we read these lines in relation to Heraclitus's concept of the logos, then suddenly what they suggest, in fact, is that no measure is beyond the structure of the cosmos. The expression of of an object in the subject is a contradictory possibility because all things exist apart from, differently from, each other and are unified by that unconditional difference. Even the object that is perceived by the subject. So put differently, while one reading of Nietzsche here might be to say that all objects are invented by subjects because we humans, for example, are always working at the level of our own perceptions, so the only object I can know is the human concept of that object, what he actually says is that there is no causality between subject and object. I'm not inventing the object that I perceive. Rather, I'm in an aesthetic relation to it. Nietzsche will shift in the next sentences of Truth and Lies into commentary on the concept of appearance, basically that he avoids the concept. But that shift is significant. He's trying to articulate the aesthetic relation between two autonomous things while avoiding the language of appearance. That is, he wants to think about this relation without defaulting to the position of his peers in philosophy, that there is this thing in itself and the appearance of the thing, and that humans can only know the latter. As I've shown in other work, Nietzsche will find a way to cross that gap between things by erasing it, or more precisely by pointing to a kind of experience that erases the boundaries, that dissolves the opposition of all things, which he calls the Dionysian. I still hold to that concept, to that experience, I still know it to be real, to be possible, to be transformative, but now I'm interested in taking seriously the other side of this erasure of boundaries, to explore what kinds of connections or relations might be possible inside the opposition and autonomy of things. I'm almost done. I would, call, I would not call Nietzsche an object-oriented ontologist, not <laughs> a long shot. But they too respond at length to, or with a focus on this gap, this opposition, that is created by the autonomy of things. In fact, the autonomy of things becomes absolutely fundamental to the movement. That autonomy in philosophy since Kant is responsible for the uncrossable gap between all things, all here again, suggesting a unity, I should note, that all things exist in opposition to each other. Okay, I'm moving quickly here because I'm running out of time. But what makes OOO so interesting to me is that it applies this autonomy to all things, not just humans. And the implications are wild. To explain, I turn to Graham Harmon. One of the most important and prolific oriented, um, object-oriented ontologists. The real object, he says, Jack Taylor loves this term. It makes no sense to me. It doesn't help me at all. But I thought I would share it with you in case you're like Jack Taylor. Um, the real object, Harmon's word, word for the thing in itself, renamed for a number of reasons, not the least of which, is an effort to move away from its associations with an essence, and with the anthropocentrism of Kant, is also his term for what I am calling an inaccessible depth. A sensual object, on the other hand, is that which can be, which is perceived. So for example, there's the inaccessible depth of a marble, which is not its essence in terms of a substance or soul, but it's a 
and unknowable depth. Alternatively, there are qualities of the marble, like its smoothness, its roundness, right, and so on, that are perceivable to us. The former withdraw from us deeper and deeper, while the latter are right here, as Herman says, brushing me directly with greater or lesser intensity, as he beautifully describes. In trying to access the depth of another, we are, quote, like moles tunneling through wind and water and ideas no less than through speech acts, text, anxiety, wonder, and dirt. We do not transcend the world, but only descend or burrow tor towards its numberless underground cavities, each a sort of kaleidoscope where sensual objects spread their colors and their wings. Thus, the difficulty is that, at least according to Western thought since Kant, as we descend or borrow, we are always working at the level of perception, always removed from the withdrawn real. This is a perplexing problem for human knowledge, and it becomes more perplexing, though not necessarily a problem, in OOO, where the question of access extends not only to humans and other animals who perceive the world in part through the mind, but also extends to inorganic matter. Using the example of the marble, again, Harman explains, quote, it's clear that the marbles must stand somewhere in reality in contact with certain other entities that stabilize them briefly in one state or another. The entities they confront cannot be real objects since these withdraw, yet these marbles are perfectly capable of distinguishing between the table and the contiguous relational environment, even if not in the pan sense of a primitive judging of ability, end quote. So to translate, the marbles do not fuse with or disintegrate into the table, nor do they evaporate into the air. They somehow, at a molecular level, distinguish between each surface, each entity. Their ability to distinguish is not conscious, but that distinguishing is happening nonetheless. If you ask a molecular biologist to explain this phenomenon, they will actually tell you that molecules talk to each other and that in that talking, they can distinguish between I and you. While this ability to distinguish is clearly disruptive to the idea that there is just one creature on the planet that intends toward anything and that possesses self-awareness, more than that, the relationship among table, marble, and air suggests something like negotiation is in play, the very stuff of rhetoric. I'm guessing that you can see the implications for rhetoric which is, as I've said, a field that I'd suggest is not so much about truth or morality, but about relations. It turns out, in this formulation, that marbles, tear, tables, and air are also rhetorical beings because they, too, negotiate. Thus, by rebooting rhetoric, in this ancient conception of logos, all things, from inorganic matter to plants to humans to other animals, become part of the web of existence, but also the negotiation that is rhetoric. So even marbles are rhetorical beings. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that rhetoric is logos or that rhetoric is the conceptual offspring of logos even. I'm suggesting that if indeed all things possess this inaccessible depth, as I've told it, and that Heraclitus noticed, noted was a condition of the logos, then that means that encounters between things of any and all kinds are always happening at ever sliding, slipping scale of depths. depths. This might open up the field to something more than the anthropocentric study of human identities, relationships, structures, 